Well, I think we will make a start. There's maybe a few more people joining us. Uh, uh, I'm Bobby Duffy. Welcome to this session on the fight for fairness in Britain. I'm director of the Policy Institute here at King's. I'm slightly regretting our viral WhatsApp and Instagram program last night of uh, publicity for this event. It's had bad timing on our part, but we've got a lovely select audience today, so we will... Uh, quality, not quantity. Quality, not quantity. <coughs> Absolutely. And we have a brilliant panel for it. We've got John uh, Penrose, MP, MP for Western Supermare, Chairman of Conservative Party Policy uh, Forum. Uh, Paula Surridge, who's Deputy Director of UK in Changing uh, Europe. There's a joint event with UK in Changing Europe. Uh, so what we're going to kick off, I'm going to run you through uh, some of the research that we've conducted recently for the IFS uh, Deaton Review. And you've got a part of that report in uh, front of you now, uh, the Unequal Britain report. Uh, and it's really about how the public divides on inequalities, what are the different types of groups that we see in terms of attitudes to inequalities. And it really, it started, the, the work started by us observing this kind of trend, where we've got a large, stable majority who think that income gaps are too high. So when you look at agreement with this British Social Attitude Survey uh, figure on, in Britain today, the gap between high, those on high incomes and those with too, uh, low incomes is too large, you get this sort of pattern over time, and it's you know, incredibly consistent, around eight and 10 people thinking that the gaps are too uh, large, but when you ask people about, oh, please come in, take a seat, uh, whether it, they agree that government should redistribute incomes from the better off to those who are less well off, you get many fewer people agreeing with that. Uh, so, very large agreement 80% <coughs> of people saying that income gaps are too high, but only 40% of people saying that uh, the government should redistribute. There is a different question from European Social Survey, which uh, asks whether the government should take measures to reduce uh, differences in income levels. So a much broader idea of uh, <coughs> uh, inequality reduction. You do get higher levels of support for that around six and 10 people over time. And again, incredibly consistent. So those two factors, the fact that we've got this gap between people thinking income gaps are too high, but fewer people saying we should do something about it, <coughs> and the fact that it's pretty stable over time in very different inequality situations across this long-term period made us think about what, what's underlying that, what's, what explains some of that. And, and we think that some of that gap is related to whether you think inequalities are structural or down to the individual. So we did a large survey of asking people lots of different questions about inequality, and then used a segmentation technique to break people down into these three groups. Um, first of all, you've got the structuralists, who are about a third of the population. And they see characteristics outside of the individual's control as important um, in determining uh, uh, whether they're rich or poor, whether they have good life chances or not, uh, things like discrimination, uh, etc. They are uh, uh, more labour and uh, more graduates, but it does uh, cut across demographics. This is not the same as your political identity, <coughs> and it's not only graduates who, who think in that type of way. Then we have individualists who, again, about three in 10 of the population, and they do not consider uh, factors beyond the control of the individual important. Much more down to the individual and individual effort in, or talent in getting on. And again, it cuts across uh, demographics. As you'd expect, it's more conservative and it's fewer graduates in, in this type of group, but it does cut across those demographics. And then you've got people who are in the middle, as we call them. Again, just over a third of the population, and they're in the middle in two senses. They're between the two groups in terms of their attitudes, but they also don't have very many strong opinions. Um, but if, if anything, they're closer to the individualists in terms of profile. Um, and you can see uh, how important that underlying worldview is when you break down some questions uh, by uh, those types of groups. But just, just taking one example around uh, this type of question, uh, which we took from a US study, and asked, it told people, on average, black people in Britain have lower earnings and are more likely to go unemployed than white people. Do you think these differences are because of a series of factors? The first one being uh, discrimination. Uh, four and ten, uh, four, uh, five and ten, more or less, people think it's because of discrimination. Three and ten say no. Uh, or do you think it's because most black people don't have the willpower, motivation or willpower uh, to pull themselves up uh, out of poverty? Much fewer people saying that, although it's still 13% of people who think it is because, one in seven people 
think it's because black people don't have the motivation or willpower to pull themselves up, which is maybe quite a surprise. But when you compare it to the US uh, figures, uh, similar on discrimination, both countries more or less uh, same proportion saying it's because of discrimination, but actually 36% of Americans say that it's because of a lack of uh, willpower or motivation. Well, black people, we are much lower on that type of uh, feeling here than in the US. But the key point is how does that vary between those three different groups that we looked at? And just looking at discrimination measure, you can see that that worldview very much influences your view of the, the role of different factors in explaining inequality. So uh, two thirds <coughs> of structuralists think it's because of discrimination that black people have lower earnings, more likely to be unemployed than white people because of discrimination. Uh, well, it's half that level among individualists. Uh, a third of individualists say it's uh, down to that. Um, so these very different worldviews uh, influencing your views of what's important in, in holding people back or uh, helping people uh, forward. Important to note on this slide, that even among that structuralist group, one in five people uh, say it's not because of discrimination that black people have uh, lower earnings, more likely to be unemployed than white people. So it's not a completely universal view among that structuralist group. And I think that's related to this third point, um, which is that there is a very strong general belief in the importance of individual merit uh, individual effort and meritocracy in uh, the UK. We are, when you look internationally compared to lots of European countries, much more focused on meritocracy, much closer to the US in terms of our attitudes to meritocracy. And you can see that when you ask people what, from a whole series of characteristics, what, uh, how important they are in terms of getting ahead in life. Um, uh, <coughs> this is the proportion that say these different things are essential or very important. You can see the top two <coughs> for both Labour and Conservative uh, supporters are hard work and having ambition. They're at the top or near the top for both uh, Labour and Conservative uh, supporters. Then, I mean, don't want to miss that, having a good education as well as a very unifying um, aspect across different groups. That comes next. But then when you look at the differences between Conservative and Labour supporters, it's all around these types of things. Knowing the right people, coming from a wealthy family, having well-educated parents, having political connections, a person's race or uh, gender. Um, so it's, it's not that Labour supporters don't think that hard work and having ambition is important, it's just that they then overlay that with these structural factors as also being important, seeing them as also uh, being important. Uh, and that belief in merit is very clear when you look at some of the views around the pandemic. Uh, so we asked people during the pandemic how important do you think luck is in determining whether people uh, lost their jobs uh, and relatively few people agree with that um, only three in ten people think that luck was important in whether people lost their jobs we generally don't like to put things down to luck uh, uh, as a general sort of rule <coughs> but much more likely to say that it was to do with the performance at work was a determining factor in whether people lost their job, which seems quite a harsh view of job losses during an indiscriminate global pandemic in some ways. But that's across groups, that cuts across groups, includes 40% of structuralists who think that that's the case too. So this is not uh, just a particular group thinking that is the case. So the importance of merit, meritocracy, uh, our view <coughs> of the importance of hard work and effort and ambition. The final point I want to make is that the pandemic does seem to have opened up at least some space for discussing the government's role in tackling inequality. So we asked people whether they agreed or disagreed <coughs> that the coronavirus crisis means there's more need for the government to take measures to reduce differences in income levels. Uh, so it's that softer work, the wording of this, not the redistribution word, which people, uh, that big groups of the population don't like, but reducing income level, uh, differences in income levels. And you do get quite high levels of agreement, that 55% <coughs> of people uh, agreeing with that overall. And that includes 4 in 10 Conservatives agreeing with that, seeing that there is, uh, the pandemic itself has shown that there is a, perhaps more justification for that, although it's only 2 in 10 of those, that individualist group, that think that's the case. So what I guess one of the key themes of the work overall is that our... Uh, attitudes to inequality and what we should do about it are very deeply embedded in our values and we have very different uh, worldviews about those types of things which makes it a very divisive 
uh, area of policy and, and action across different political parties. But there was one thing, <coughs> one unifying theme that came out across different groups, including structuralist individualists and, uh, and uh, conservative and, and Labour Party supporters, and that is the UK's high level of concern about area-based inequality that runs across uh, different groups. So when you ask people which three or four of the following types of inequality do you think are most serious in Britain, it is between more, more and less deprived areas that comes top uh, for people at or near the top again and cutting across uh, different political groups, much bigger differences between Labour and Conservative forces on things like income and wealth, but particularly between racial or ethnic groups, much more emphasised among Labour supporters than Conservative supporters. But that uh, focus on area-based inequalities and that link to levelling up as an agenda is authentically felt across lots of different uh, people uh, and lots of different groups and uh, worldviews. And we, we did as part of this study an international uh, study that asked about this, this same question across lots of different countries. And the UK was by far the most likely to pick out area-based inequalities compared to the US and uh, the rest of Europe. We do have that strong sense of geographical inequality. So final reflections for me before handing on to, to John first. Um, whether you worry about inequalities depends on how fair or unfair you see them. And that's the fundamental uh, focus of the work that we're doing as part of the IFS Deaton view and Angus Deaton's view of the importance of inequality. It's all about, is it unfair? That's what, what makes it important to people. Well, that in turn depends on your view of the causes of it, in particular whether you see it, it's down to these inequalities are down to the individual or down to structural things that hold them back, which in turn is related to deeply held values and your worldview. And that's why it's relatively unshifting uh, over time. This does not go around up and down very much, these kind of overall worldviews on these types of things. Important to say that in the report that you've got, the little unequal Britain one, there's more movement in some attitudes. And the belief that benefits are too low, for example, and cause hardship has been rising in a long way. Uh, for a long time it was declining. People did not see benefits as too high, uh, too low, sorry, and uh, causing hardship. But now that's coming up again. It has been coming up for the last few years, and it's uh, likely to continue to climb. So individual attitudes or uh, views of particular issues do, do shift, but these underlying uh, drivers don't so much. Um, but, as you say, it, there are these common, this common ground on area-based inequalities, which is, is really important and is absolutely core to the levelling up agenda. And we need to interpret that carefully um, to deliver on the public perception of what levelling up means to them. As part of this work for IFS, uh, there was also focus groups done, and it was very clear people had quite a nuanced <coughs> view of what that meant. And it isn't simple north-south divide, it is every region. One of the reasons it cuts across is it's every region Everyone's got their own experience of the local area disadvantage that they really uh, worry about. So it's quite a, it's a, a nuanced and, and uh, intricate area, but very, very important to people nonetheless. Uh, so final point for me, I think we do have an open door for discussion of inequalities across parties with the public overall, but only if we understand these very wide variety of starting points. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Bobby. And can I start by saying, A, thank you for organising this fascinating uh, discussion this morning, but also um, you know, kudos to, to you for trying to dig into, I think, one of the biggest and most fundamental questions that is facing the country at the moment. And it's this really big, slippery, hard to get your fingers around um, notion of fairness, which well, you say underlies everybody's view of inequality and is it, you know, how serious it is and, and what's, what's behind it. So a really big important concept that you know, has huge political ramifications as well as economic and social ones as well. I thought this was a really interesting uh, set of conclusions as well. Can you pull up your first, your first slide with the three lines on it? Yeah. Um, from, a, from a Conservative Party point of view, um, I thought that this first slide um, was something which is, just shows us, that one there, thank you, uh, shows us the opportunity, um, and actually if you're a lefty, it's deeply, deeply depressing as well. Um, and the reason why is because what it shows us, I think, um, is that the idea of you can solve everything by just tweaking the benefit system a bit and doing a bit more redistribution and equalising income in one way or another is you know, clearly not something which is 
growing or indeed is you know, taking the trick for a large chunk of people in this country. Um, but there is nonetheless a real appetite, that middle line, for government to do something but not redistribution. And that, I think, takes us directly to this notion of, of levelling up because what it says is, look, if you are just doing redistribution, effectively you are uh, treating the symptoms of poverty, you're treating the symptoms of unfairness and fairness, you're treating the symptoms of inequality. Um, and the whole point about levelling up is that's all very well, but what we need to do is to look at the causes. What's lying behind this? What is driving all of this stuff? Let's not try and just treat the symptoms. Let's not bandage the cut. Let's try and heal the underlying um, problems as well. And I think that just on a political point of view, uh, that means that there's a huge opportunity for us as a centre-right movement to be able to not just win elections on the back of this, but also move those attitudes which haven't moved for decades, as you can see. We can move those attitudes, because if we can turn around to people and say, we are fixing the underlying problems rather than doling out more in, in redistributive benefits, then all of a sudden, the structurists go, oh, okay, well actually there isn't so much of a structural thing to overcome anymore. We start to win people over permanently, fundamentally, um, and that dictates and will drive a whole series of other values, and they'll drive them towards um, a, a, a sort of a, a conservative view of the world, if we can get this right. And it isn't just a political opportunity, of course, it's also an e economic and a social opportunity. So the Conservative Party can do well by doing good, because by fixing those underlying structural um, points, then we actually make Britain just a better place. We make ourselves into a better society, we make ourselves, in, make ourselves into a fairer society, an opportunity society. Um, but we've also got to realise, as that graph shows, that successive governments of all stripes have tried this over a long time um, and we ain't made an awful lot of progress. You know, that's, the, that's the harsh reality. So fixing those underlying problems of inequality of opportunity lack of agency, lack of preparedness to take those opportunities, even when they've been levelled up and equalised between different groups of society, different parts of the country, that is going to be a long, slow old road, and it's not something which would, is easy, otherwise successive governments would have done it already. So that, that's point one. Like, it, it's just, it's a massive, oh, it's not an open goal, it's a very difficult goal for us to slot the ball into the net on, but my word, I'd rather be in our party addressing this um, with our approach to trying to deal with inequality um, and our approach to trying to deal with fairness than I would with where the current Labour Party's view of the issue is. I think that shows just what a, um, a sort of dead end they've reversed themselves into over time. Bobby, can I trouble you to go right the way through to your penultimate slide, the one which shows um, uh, ge geographical, everyone's views yeah. about what's, what's most important. This one I thought was um, both, both really interesting but also very depressing indeed. Um, I think everybody signs up to that top point about geography should not be destiny. Um, we can all see why, why that's important. Again, if you can fix the underlying causes of poverty and if you can follow some of the work, for example, done by the Centre for Cities about how you do place-based um, uh, regeneration, then we can probably make real strides towards fixing that top piece and that is the right thing to do, doesn't matter which party you're in, doesn't matter what your worldview is, doesn't matter if you're a structuralist or an individualist, we should do that anyway. Um, the bit that's really depressing isn't that top box. The bit that's really depressing is three from the bottom, health and life expectancies, which ranks sixth in Peter's people's order of importance. Um, and I think that is something that we as a society, not as a party, not as, a, um, not, not as, a, as anything else, but we as a society, we should be seriously ashamed of not thinking that that's important. Um, and it's really important because you know, if you look at the Marmot Review, for example, into health inequalities, it's really, really clear that the causes of health inequalities overlap very, very, very strongly with unfairness, with lack of opportunity, with lack of economic outcomes or inequalities as well. Um, it, it's also really clear, everyone says, that something like 80% of your health outcomes have got very little to do with the treatment you receive in a hospital or in the NHS, and much more to do with where you're brought up, the housing that you live in, and all, all sorts of other things as well. And so that shows us, that figure shows us, that you know, people have kind of accepted the sort of fatalistic attitude that you can't fix, that it isn't terribly important to fix health inequalities. Um, and A, I think that's morally inexcusable for all of us, 
and because there's nothing more important than having, a, having good health. A, 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 you know, it, it's sort of fundamental, if you like. Um, but also, it just shows that we you know, haven't clocked as a society that health inequalities and fairness across the rest of our lives are inextricably in a, intertwined, that they share an awful lot of common causes, and you're never going to get to fix poverty unless you are also trying to fix health inequalities. Or put another way, if you fix the causes of, it, of poverty, you'll fix an awful lot of health inequalities too. Um, and so that's really worrying that as a society we don't get that link and that we don't think it's important um, or that we don't think it's fixable and we're just fatalistic about it. I'm not quite sure what, that, what those numbers show, but it shows some combination of those three things. And I think that's really worrying. But I also think, again, um, if as a party we can fix those underlying causes of both poverty and of health inequalities, um, then there's both a political opportunity, there's a social opportunity, there's a health opportunity, um, but there's also an enormous social and, eco and, and economic opportunity too. So really important work, probably really, really fascinating yeah. stuff. And I think it just shows us as a party where we should be going, both because it's the right thing to do, but also because it will strengthen our position and, and start to win the battle of ideas around one of the fundamental and central things which this, this country has to address over the course of the next decade. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Paula. Thank you. So I wanted to start out um, looking at some of the things that have happened over the last two or three years and how they may have influenced what people think of as being fair. And obviously, um, the key one there is the um, pandemic. It's exposed inequalities, health inequalities, but all sorts of other inequalities um, that we knew were there, but it's really given them um, new exposure, new publicity, I suppose, in some ways. But it's also revealed new divides as well as old divides. So, for example, I think we haven't talked nearly enough about what's going to happen with this divide between being able to work from home and not being able to work from home and what that means for people's choices in the short term in terms of protecting themselves from a... Um, from a global pandemic in the longer term about where people can choose to live and, and other sorts of choices that will come from that. And obviously the key things that have been revealed are inequalities in education and in health, perhaps the two areas that have been most impacted um, directly by the pandemic. In the report, I think it's, I hope it's the report that's on your chairs, um, the Policy Institute research showed that more than half of people see it as unfair that money can buy better services in education and health. So people do see being able to do better in some of these things simply because you have more income as unfair. So it starts to get at what fairness means and, and what people think of as fair and unfair. I think the other thing that the pandemic has done is it's changed what people might think is possible. So the way that people were, the way that we were able to at least temporarily solve homelessness by using hotels to house people and so on. It's changed what people think might be possible um, in, in this world. And at UK in a Changing Europe, we did some focus groups um, last summer with what we called comfortable leavers, who were people who'd voted leave but were on median incomes um, or above. And one of them commented about, about COVID, perhaps it's loosened the purse strings. So I think that would be important as we come out of the pandemic, that people might expect some of these higher levels of spending to persist and solve inequalities and other problems, um, which seems to be something slightly at odds with some of the some of the speeches we've heard this week. On the other side of that, though, so far we haven't seen um, again that the report on your chairs haven't seen um, a really strong desire for radical reform. Um, we, we've seen lots of talk of build back better as a slogan for this week, but even before that, we were seeing lots of talk of build back better. Quite often it seemed to me build back whatever it was I wanted before, but that's, that's another issue. Um, but we haven't in the public seen that really strong desire for reform. Most people actually want their lives to go back to how they were before, um, and they haven't started to think through how things might be different. But I, don't, I think it's still too soon, actually, to know if that's going to be where we end up post-pandemic. Um, if I can just put my academic hat on for a moment, when we... Um, look at the values people hold. We go, often go back to the work of Ron Inglehart, who came up with this idea of post-materialism, that when people feel secure, when people feel safe, 
they start to worry about other issues rather than money, rather than the material issues of security, both financial and kind of physical security. We've been through a period where people have felt really, really insecure. And I don't think we can say for sure at this point whether that's going to have an impact on long-term values and whether it's going to push people to value the material again um, more highly, perhaps, than they have done um, over recent decades. Where we do see um, a push for more radical change or an ex expectation of more <laughs> radical change um, is around expectations of Brexit. And it would, perhaps not something you would immediately connect with fairness. Um, and if you look at the data, um, the data that we have at UKIS, the expectations of personal financial gain from Brexit were low. Okay, people, didn't, people didn't vote leave because they thought they personally were going to be better off. But the expectations for change in local areas and in the country more widely was very high. Um, again, quoting one of these comfortable levers, it can only have a positive effect on enabling local areas to improve their infrastructure, health, police and services that require lots of investment. So we're back to that investment point again and the spending, but also this kind of high expectations of change in local areas. And I think that's something we'll have to come back to um, about what local means to people, because it's not clear to me that levelling up at big macro geographic areas is necessarily capturing what people wanted in terms of change in their local area. Which brings me on to levelling up. Um, there is some debate about the extent to which this is something that's cut through in the public um, more generally. Do people, do people know what levelling up means? And I think this is a danger, perhaps, um, for the Conservative Party as well as an opportunity. So the danger is that people project onto levelling up what they wanted to happen. And then no matter what the government say levelling up is, and however they measure that they've succeeded in doing it, if people's expectations haven't been met, they will see it as a failure. But it seems to connect really strongly with both that desire for post-Brexit change and these core aspects of inequality that people see as important. So it's managing to, to fit messages together that are already out there um, in public attitudes. And that's what makes it powerful, I think. Rather than trying to impose an idea and a message, it's, it's drawing on something that is already there. So what could go wrong? A wonderful idea to reduce inequality, a great slogan, what could possibly go wrong? The first is what, I've been say what I just said about what will success look like. Um, ministers can define success however they want, but people have ideas of what they think is going to be delivered. And if they don't match up with reality, I think there could be, there, there could be trouble ahead. The, the flip side of that, though, is that there, are, there is still a lot of scepticism about what government can deliver. Um, and I th still think a little bit of kind of, I can't quite think of the word, but kind of benefit of the doubt of that, well, <coughs> the pandemic got in the way, and if it hadn't got in the way, maybe these things would have been delivered. But that's only going to last for so long. It will run thin in the public eventually. Um, politically, then, voters are volatile. The Conservative Party have been the winners of that volatility in, in recent elections. But there's no guarantee they will continue to be so. The new Conservative voters from 2019 are some of the most volatile voters. Um, they don't have a, a sense of identity with the Conservative Party. They don't feel kind of gelled to the Conservative Party in any way, which again means you've got to keep, keep winning them over, keep convincing them. They will need to see and feel the success of levelling up. It would not be good enough simply to tell them that ex extra pounds have been spent in their areas. They will need to see and feel it. They will need to feel that social infrastructure has improved. There is a, a, a real danger, I think, of losing those voters to other parties. But actually, I think the bigger danger is losing them to non-voting. I think there's a real danger that if change doesn't happen in those areas, people will just become completely disengaged from politics. So it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter who we vote for, things never get any better. And then the second danger, I think, is um, the divisions that exist within the Conservative coalition. Um, in the same way that the um, Brexit divide tended to pull the left apart, 
you've now got divisions on economics that can, that can pull the conservative coalition apart. And also, so many of those new conservative voters, if I can, if I can use that phrase, um, had such high expectations, not for themselves personally, but of Brexit more generally, that it's going to be very, very difficult in the time frame to the next election to convince them it's been delivered. Thank you, Paula. Great. Um, so we've, I wanted to come to David Kutar, who uh, is uh, was going to join our panel, but he has to go off. I think is your interview with is it the no? No, I'm I'm chairing something on levelling up actually with totally Neil O'Brien at ten thirty. So um, <laughs> yes. So we get we get we get David's quick thoughts. And yeah. Uh, um, no, thank you, um, all of you. Uh, that that was um, that was very interesting. And the whole structural individual thing, I think, is, is a fascinating way of cutting it up. I think um, the, the dominant public narrative uh, leans very strongly towards the structural um, in, in Britain at the moment, and I think, I think it tends to be reinforced by, by left identity politics too, um, and I think, I think that partly explains the very hostile response, say, to the CRED report, although the, I mean, the CRED report, I think, was not so much um, uh, offending the structuralists by being individualist so much as looking at other structures apart from race to explain differences, um, you know, class, geography, family, uh, and so on. <coughs> by the way, black women have higher average incomes than white women, um, so you might um, adjust your slide slightly on that one. Um, but as John and Paula say, I think um, there's quite, there is actually perhaps surprisingly quite a lot of good news for um, for the Tories, but particularly perhaps on the, 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 the levelling up Tories anyway, um, from from these surveys. I think one um, one thing, and I think John pointed out that, that it's interesting perhaps that health inequalities um, don't feature more strongly, um, and I think the debate about health inequalities is overwhelmingly, and I think partly wrongly, structural. Um, I mean. You know, even the Tories never really talk about, you know, lifestyle, personal responsibility. You know, when 30% of young children uh, arrive at school at the age of five already obese or proto-obese, um, you know, this is surely something where, where individual um, responsibility has to, has to play a role. Um, and yet we hardly ever hear that. Um, I mean, my, my final point is that one of the things that uh, is perhaps um, sort of too difficult almost to talk about <laughs> in this whole argument about, um, about sort of sources of inequality and meritocracy and so on is the whole issue of cognitive ability and perhaps you know, the attitudes that allow one to, um, to, to use your cognitive ability, which are partly inherited. Um, and you know, parents will always find ways of handing on um, their advantages, if they have them, to their children. You can abolish private schools, you can do whatever you like, you know, look at all societies across time, and that happens, and will always happen. And uh, it just raises the question of whether, you know, whether that is fair or not, given you know, how you know, the returns to qualification and so on, particularly in, in our societies in the last few decades with mass higher education and, and um, uh, you know, cognitive ability becoming sort of the gold standard of esteem and reward, um, what, uh, what we can do about that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you David. Um, just to go, before we just come, if people have got questions or comments, it'd be great to hear them from people generally. Just on, on that health one, because I do think it is really interesting that it comes up quite so low and I, I think a lot of my work is on people's misperceptions of social and political realities and I, I don't think there is quite the cognition that there are these big gaps in life expectancies and that there is a decline in life expectancies for some groups in the UK. This is people have not noticed that I don't think so. I think there's an element of we haven't we haven't noticed and it's uh, and then I think related to David's point, I think there is when you look at the survey data on this, there is a strong sense among the public of personal responsibility for your health outcomes. Um, there is definitely a bit there that is about health services and the differences in health services for us, but, but the, the extent to which lifestyle things affect your health 
is a very natural place that the public go to very quickly on this, which again may explain why it seemed less mm. of a sort of mm. national national issue, more down to the individual. But it, really interesting. Thank you, David. Sorry, uh, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. At the back, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the, um, thank you for the research. It's very interesting. So, uh, really much interesting. Um, um, I'm from Solihull, um, where we have uh, half our borough, uh, one of the richest boroughs in the country, and the other half of the borough um, has a life expectancy of 10 years less than the south. Yeah. Um, um, and what separates it is the A45 Coventry Road, for those of you who have heard So, uh, um, so you know, marked uh, thing. What, what, what I would say is that, you know, my experience of that is that it's, it's not just about health, it's about uh, that's that's a systemic problem that you've got second, third generation unemployed in there, you've got all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of underlying issues and it, it, it worries me to, to an extent, I mean, you know, that, you know, um, actually, ah, uh, you know, is the Conservative Party in touch with that, you know, that, that problem really, you know, and, you know, if I was to be critical, yeah, um, I'd say the behaviours at this conference doesn't illustrate that. If they'd be horrified by, it, <laughs> by the behaviours at this conference, yeah, yeah, particularly in the evenings and whatever, yeah. Um, um, so, uh, is 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 that is that in touch with this problem? Because this is a, yeah, we really got to get to the heart and soul and win hearts and minds if we're going to be successful. Um, hello. Um, so there's a lot of talk about levelling up, and um, government's going to, going to have to deliver, obviously. But so my question is then, on the data, what um, sources of data do we have on public attitudes on the on government performance on all of those fairness issues, and then how reliable it is? So we, when I run the immigration <coughs> trackers, there's a, quest, there's a question there's what people know about. Um, you know, what do you think of the government's performance on immigration? And actually, it's always pretty poor, and it's got it's got worse. And I suspect on something like that, that um, they're pleasing nobody. You know, there's people on either side of But I wonder, you know, how can you get at this in a kind of reliable way? So I think it's going to be really important uh, to see whether actually that message is getting through, whether the things that are put in place are actually working as far as people are concerned. Yeah. Very good question. Thank you. Any answers? Yes, let's take three. Uh, Will Snell from the Fairness yeah. Foundation, which will be launching soon to change the debate around fairness in the UK. Question for John around your point about um, levelling up and tackling the causes rather than the symptoms. Just wonder if you could elaborate what, your, what you think those actions are in the short term, at least. Great. Thank you. Go first, John. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, gentlemen at the back, I'll, I'll start with you, sir, because um, I'm, I'm completely with you about the, the sort of shared causes, the overlapping causes of um, health inequalities and poverty yeah, and, and, and socioeconomic um, inequality as well. There isn't a complete or perfect overlap by any manner of means, but there's an awful lot of things which, you know, if you are, um, if you are a chaotic drug user. It's going to hit your going to hit your health, obviously, but it's also going to make it jolly hard for you to hold down a job, um, become prosperous in any way, etc., etc. So you, we can all see why those things overlap just naturally, um, and so therefore the kinds of things that we need to be doing are to fix those underlying causes. Some of those are driven by lifestyle, mm. yeah, and some of those are to do with other factors which are currently structural, and we're going to need to make structural changes to deal with those causes in order to. Um, erode the structuralist preconceptions because it will no longer be true. That's why it's difficult. That's why it hasn't happened for years. Um, I, I also I had a small internal smile so when you, you mentioned the, the behaviour in, the, in, in conference uh, uh, in the evenings. I, I just think we need to be... I think that Bobby's right as well to say, look, there's a, this ought to be natural conservative territory about talking about you know, um, uh, individual responsibility. But we've got to be really, really careful that we don't come across as a bunch of preachy Roundheads, as well. Which I don't think is what you're saying, sir. But no. we just got to be really careful that that I don't think we've yet developed the right language, the right tone, in order to be able to talk about this in a way which isn't judgmental and finger waggy, um, and doesn't stop people from having a good time, um, but also says, you know, but we've all got to you know, enjoy all things in moderation, sort of thing. So there's a there's a really difficult thing for all politicians 
um, no matter what, you know, what they're elected to, to strike that balance. And I don't think anyone's quite got it yet. So I think it's a really valuable and important point. On the, on the gentleman from the Fairness Foundation, so it sounds like you and I should talk afterwards as well. Um, there's a whole series of things that, that we need to do. Um, some of them are structural, like you know, reforms to the honours system, which seems like a closed shop. Um, uh, re reforms to the way that, um, that uh, our, our universities grant degrees. Why is it that a 2-1 from one university is not seems as, seems as good as a 2-1 from another? That can't be right, for example. So there's a whole bunch of structural things. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of things to do with agency as well. To, to get people to, to be able to use the opportunities when we finish levelling those opportunities up. Um, and that's to do with further education and lifelong learning um, and the whole series of really big um, obstacles to people. You know, just try retraining. If you lose your job in your 30s or 40s when you've got kids and a mortgage or rent or whatever it might be and you need to retrain because not because you did anything wrong to your point about judgmental attitudes to people losing their jobs, but just because some so-and-so has invented an app which has meant that the, 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 the sector you worked in no longer exists, so your schools are out of date. You've got to retrain, you're willing to retrain, and you can't flip and do it, or it's very, very hard, unnecessarily hard, um, compared to you know, other people. So, so there's a whole series of under, underlying fundamental things that we need to change. Um, small plug, I'm going to be publishing some, um, some pr policy proposals in precisely this area, which is why you and I should talk about it later. Excellent. Paula. Uh, thank you. I don't have, I don't think I have an answer as such to, to the gentleman at the back, but I think there is a real, um, a real problem there because there is the danger that politicians of any, of any party um, just come across as do as I say, not as I do. Um, and that is, in, I mean, it's, it's there in health, but it's equally there um, when we look at choices people make in education as well, for example. So I think it is a real danger ground for politicians and one that a new language is perhaps needed. Um, the question that I know the, the most about is, is the question about about the uh, the question about the questions, I suppose. Um, <coughs> so, things like um, the British Social Attitude Survey, the British Election Survey, they do ask questions about government performance on particular things. There's always a tension, though, between asking about the things that have always been asked about, so you can produce the lovely time series <laughs> like what we did at the start, and asking about the things that are topical, and you just always have to find that balance. Um, and sometimes I think sometimes I think you have to use the questions you have and make some of the connections yourself. So one of the questions that I've used in that vein, um, the British Election Survey, I think it was Wave 20, which was last summer, um, asked some questions about whether or not people perceived parties as looking after their local area, which I think is, and it gets, if you ask directly about government performance, then you start to drag how people voted and their perceptions of parties into that in, in sometimes in ways that aren't helpful. But that looks after my area question was really interesting. And I used it to create this measure um, whether people thought both parties looked after their, par their area, no party looks after their area, or just one. Um, and it was really closely related, the, the, and I was quite surprised because I didn't, didn't expect it to do much work, if I'm honest, as a question. Um, it was really closely related um, to whether or not constituencies had changed in the last election. And it was particularly areas where people felt no party looked after their area that had changed. I guess it was a kind of, well, we've tried this, let's try something different kind of approach. But that's where I think the danger then lies. If they go back to that, nobody does anything for us. I think there's a real danger of some significant drops in turnout and disengagement in some of those areas. Um, and we've, we've worried, I suppose, <laughs> academics at least, have worried about tur turnout in kind of younger generations over the last two decades. But these are actually um, older people starting, who have previously voted, turning away from the system, which is a different kind of problem. Really interesting. Really interesting. So um, just to, to follow up on that, because I, I didn't realise that, that work actually, although that's really, because I, I was going to pick up on Heather's point a little bit. Though. My background was in area-based initiatives, evaluating the impact of putting lots of money and effort into small areas like uh, previous governments, New Deal for Communities, or Single Regeneration Budget, or City Challenge, and all these endless area-based area uh, programs. And what that showed was how incredibly difficult it is to turn around people's perceptions of their areas. And the New Deal for Communities was you know, a uh, gave each of these very small areas millions and millions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds, um, 
um, in order to turn around um, aspects of the, and how intertwined people's perspectives were on, it wasn't just about skills and jobs, it was about the physical infrastructure, it was about social connections, it was about all, it was about the health services, it was about everything that people saw. But how determinant that was in how happy people were was huge. So it's going to be, echoes your point about um, the ones that were successful were incredibly successful um, in terms of how they changed people's views about um, uh, their own lives. Uh, so that, that, that importance of geography and very, very local geography is uh, one of the key things, I think, one of the key lessons for, for across those types of things. Sorry, so there was a question. Yes, please. Um, I've got two slightly interlinked questions, if I, if I may. Very good. Um, both of which relate like to comments that have been made so far. The first is, do we think people actually understand what health inequality is? Um, and if not, does it matter? And what do we need to do about it? And the second comes back to something uh, you said, John, about uh, don't be preachy roundheads. And uh, thinking about it, in a previous um, role, I worked on uh, some public health messaging, and we would often be, we went out of our way not to be preachy roundheads, uh, but we were often uh, accused of being. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the panel's uh, advice on, um, on a public health messaging? Very good. Very good question. Any others? Yes, please. Uh, Nick Veal from Amigo Loans. Uh, one of the biggest drivers of individual social mobility has been the ability for people to obtain credit, to better themselves, to get, to get a, a, in a van, be a white van man, to, to get put down a deposit for a new rental property. Um, I think we've seen over the last few years, particularly at uh, the FCA, uh, make it harder for people to lend to people that need uh, this, this opportunity. And I'm wondering what your what your approach is to ensuring that people who need and could really benefit from access to credit uh, have that available. Mm -hmm. Great. Any others? Great. John, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, so, um, I asked you a question about do do people understand what health, health inequalities are? Um, yeah, I think we, if they don't think about it very often, but it's something which they grasp in one sentence. If you talk about you know. Um, healthy life lifespan, that sort of stuff, people get it really fast. Um, I think it's more a question of just people don't pay very much attention to it. And I think part of that is because when we talk about inequalities and we talk about fairness in this country, we still have a kind of Downton Abbey kind of view of the whole thing. We see it all through a, through a lens of um, end of the 19th century or Edwardian and Victorian, um, you know, upstairs, downstairs sort of thing. And it's all about class and it's all about income. Um, and those things still matter, although actually probably a bit less than they did a generation or two ago. But that whole narrative doesn't talk about health. And so we tend to ignore it because we're still sort of you know, bound up in, in that approach. And I think that's where one of the fundamentals that's got to change about us paying an awful lot more attention to that. Um, how, do, how do we handle public health messaging? Um, I, I, think, um, I think Paula's point was, was absolutely right, that you know, the difficulty with politicians talking about this is, you know, we're no better than the rest of the population. Um, we, we, you know, we, we can't claim to be um, you know, you know, perfect examples of healthy living or anything else. Um, and I think that there's a, so it isn't just politicians who've got to do this, it's got to be the medical community as well, and opinion formers. I mean, it was really interesting looking at some of the stuff to get people to either get vaccinated or get tested during the, during the pandemic. And they were using, they were using the Pakistani foot, um, cricket team um, as opinion formers, for example, for you know, targeting particular sections of the UK population. Um, so I think that is something where I, I don't think anybody's got the answer to it at the moment. Um, but you know, but except perhaps perhaps we might start with the Catholic Church. You know, we're all sinners. Um, it might be a good starting point just to just to avoid that. But I, I, I don't pretend to have the answer to that one, sir. But you are right. It is the sort of the acid test question about how we manage it. Um, on access to credit, I would argue that access to credit is one of the fixable structural obstacles, not for a lot of people, and a lot of people manage without um, access to credit, but for some it really, really matters. Um, and we just got to be really, really careful in what we do um, about that to make sure that in improving access to credit for people who are, um, who are financially marginalized or, um, or, or less sort of um, in a less sustainable position, um, that we don't expose them to the loan sharks that have, you know, made given that part of our economy a bad name so there's a difficult balance to strike there but it is one of the structural issues which if we can fix it will help a small group of people a lot if i could do it that way 
Um, I'm sorry, I've really got absolutely nothing to add <laughs> on credit availability. It's, it's not my uh, area of expertise at all. But I could perhaps say a little bit about whether or not the people understand health inequalities. Um, so I think the phrase postcode lottery is quite well understood. I think people understand that and they understand what it means. One of the problems with survey questions like the one um, used here is that health inequalities doesn't quite capture that in the same, in the same way. It's harder to, harder to um, think what that might mean. And I think also I, I was thinking about that particular question. People are asked on that question to kind of rate the top three. So if you think health inequalities are actually the result of differences in income and wealth or area, you're going to rate those perhaps higher because you think if you can fix those, it, it will kind of fix the health inequalities. But people, people do see health inequalities. Like I said, they do understand the idea of postcode lottery. I hear lots of people, I live, I live kind of close to, the, close to the Welsh border, so I get lot, hear lots of comparisons about kind of, well, if you hop over the border, you can have a free prescription and things like that. So people understand that, that there are these differences within the health service. People under, understand that, but they don't necessarily relate it to individual health outcomes, which I think it would be really interesting to create an index that, that was similar to meritocracy, but for health, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and that kind of, most people think that, that your own interventions are going to be the most important for your health, and they don't necessarily see those structural things in quite the same way. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we did. We saw that quite a lot in the more in-depth survey work, and then the focus groups that we did. That that, that sense of postcode lottery is incredibly strong in uh, in the UK, um, and it explains on our next session actually a bit about culture war, the, the links into the culture war. It kind of runs through cultural differences as well. So it's a, kind of it's a very strong, a very strong sense of uh, identity within um, the UK. The thing about uh, one of the one of the things, very few things that people get completely spot on about our social and political life and kind of economic and other types of facts is average life expectancies. People have a very clear view of what average life expectancies are. The only other thing that people get completely right are average house prices. So we've got this very we've got this very strong connection to how long are we going to live and how much is our house worth is um, is very clear with people. What they don't have, and we've tested this and other things is a very clear idea of, at all of how much it varies across different groups. There's no real sense, actually, you've got a very much lower chance of living that length of time, uh, length of life in different sorts of areas or if you come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So we, I think there is an element of a lack of awareness of uh, those types of things. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so does that follow even in, so if you're someone like Merthyr, yeah. which have a, would they understand, look, uh, the rest of the UK is what 77 or whatever it is, and ours is 20. Would they understand that in their areas? Not according to uh, the specific of Merthyr, I don't know, but the kind of on average across the different areas, people don't have a clear idea of, you know, the tube map in London where you go from, you, you lose a year or two every every stop, those types of things. There's not that very clear sense of those those types of things people hear. And it's partly because it's just a repeated figure in the same way. The reason we were very motivated to know how much our house is worth, but it's also, it appears in the news a lot, where you get that figure coming uh, through a lot about uh, how much our average house price is. So people don't think that deeply about it. And I do, I do think it is intertwined with that sense of personal responsibility for your, for your own health, where it isn't the sort of thing that you think other people can resolve for you beyond that sense of health services and postcode lottery. I think that is. But in all these things, people are contradictory. You know, we all are contradictory and have a whole different ideas of what's the cause or outcome of these types of things in, in our heads at the same time. So it's not that people have an absolutely clear, consistent picture uh, on those types of things. Um, great. Well, I mean, excellent discussion. If, if there's no burn, oh, there is. There is a burning one, question. One last one. <laughs> great. Um, I was just wondering, listening to all of this as an you know, insider and an outsider, I was born in Germany but lived most of my life here. Yeah. And um, isn't class, you did, I noticed you didn't mention class, on, for instance, it plays into obviously the regional differences, the wealth, income and the education parts, but class in itself is not being addressed. Is that the big elephant in the room or are you trying to move away from this? And the next question is plays into this, and that's education. Yeah. And I think we all have plenty of anecdotes to tell about 
how uh, the differences, if, if there were breaks between uh, private and state education before, they are now so huge. It's, I mean, I know of kids who sat next to, um, where, the, where the mother sat next to their um, Zoom lessons um, for a year before kids in state schools even yeah. had a computer. So I don't know how you're going to, but how, how yeah, it's even absolutely. possible to address this. Very good, very good. So let's um, take that question. And any final thoughts from the panel, and then we'll wrap it up there. Uh, let's start with Paula and then go on next. I'm going to say something that's probably not very going to be very popular in this room, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> of course. And that is, I think that as other governments have done in the past, talking about levelling up is a way of not talking about class and not talking about income inequality. Um, and education feeds into that. Um, I think that's, but I don't think that's unique to this government. I think, um, I think the Blair government did it as well to a certain extent. <laughs> I, I think it's one of those things that that we don't, we want to talk about geography rather than individuals. And actually, I think in the case of levelling up, what I, I would go back to the point I made earlier about it needing to be local levels rather than a big swathe of the north that is that is the focus of levelling up because I think that gets at the point that there are people whose opportunities need to be leveled up um, just as many, you know, there are people like that in the southeast just as there are in the northwest or the northeast. Um, and so that's why I find the, the kind of pulling together of leveling up with the kind of red wall discourse really problematic because I think it makes it, I think it takes the focus away from individuals. Very good. Go on, final one. Um, so uh, I'm entirely comfortable talking about class, I think class is still really important in the UK. Um, the reason I decided to join the Conservative Party, I joined the Conservative Party the day after John Major, when he first became leader of the Conservative Party, said he wanted to see a classless society. And um, so to the extent that as a party we are about opportunity and, e and levelling up opportunities and equipping people to be able to take those opportunities, um, I think the reason why the Conservative Party doesn't like talking about class is we don't like the concept. We sort of, it's, it's inherently you know, an anathema to us that your birth should dictate your, your, your destiny. Um, and therefore what we want as a, as a party is to make sure that it doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you're going and how, and how you're prepared to do that. Um, and class may make a difference to some communities, but it isn't, incidentally, a sort of you know, uniform picture. I'm sure that Paul would have a complete fit if anybody said um, you know, that, that someone who's a working class white, class white person in my constituency in Western Supermare is the same as a working class, any other kind of person um, in either central Manchester or in central Glasgow or whatever it might be. So it's, it's a powerful thing still, and it really matters still, um, but it is also a very high level and quite disparate thing, and it varies an awful lot, and therefore people have to sort of dig underneath to understand how we're going to create a genuine opportunity society which overcomes those you know, underlying, um, underlying differences in opportunity which of which class is a, still a powerful predictor in some cases. Um, and I'd also take your point about education. The, the thing about education is that we have made huge strides um, ever since Blair started the academization program and we've now sort of industrialized it. Um, huge strides in the way that um, state school education has improved. I absolutely agree with you that that's taken a knock during the pandemic, but I can see no reason why we can't get that back. Um, because the underlying fundamentals are still there now, we're starting to get back to normal, and we need to we need to carry that on. The next bit of that battle um, is less to do with schools. We need to allow that academisation program to continue. It has to be in further and higher education, it's in tertiary education and lifelong learning. Right. That's the thing that will is is the bit which is depriving too many people of further opportunities as the world changes faster during the course of a working life. Great. Yeah, good three ball. Uh, great way to end. Well, thank you for that. Uh, just leaves it for me to say thank you to the team for organising this. Uh, thank you to you for coming as our select, very select audience for this uh, excellent event. And of course, biggest thanks all to our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.